So have you ever had that experience of being with a narcissistic person and they're like two people? There's the part of them that can lie and cheat and gaslight and be downright mean. But then even later that day, heck, even later that hour, they can be calm, kind of nice, maybe even order your favorite meal or offer to pick your family up from member up from the airport. So drop a comment if that sort of two people in one experience sounds familiar. Now you think you're the one who's losing it under these circumstances, right? No, not so much. This sort of two people in one is a pattern that may link to an early origin of narcissism, which is compartmentalization. So let's take on how this happens in childhood and how it plays out in adulthood, especially in narcissistic adults. So back to this series on sort of how to make a narcissist. And ideally, you do the opposite so you don't. This is a series that in many ways is focused on parents who are sometimes wondering, what are the things I need to do to avoid this? But in some ways, it can also sometimes help people sort of understand these patterns. It doesn't mean you want to excuse them, right? That's not the point of this series. But it's important that you to understand these dynamics, again, especially from the parenting perspective, can be quite useful. And as always, thanks for tuning in to this channel. Please consider giving this video a thumbs up. Please consider subscribing to this channel. It helps this channel get promoted because really my goal is to educate as many people as possible, but also make as many narcissist resistant people out there so we can lessen the number of enablers, right? So let's take on this issue. You want to you wanna make a narcissist or not? So let's talk about compartmentalization. One of the most prolific and influential scholars of narcissism and personality styles that are related to narcissism is Dr. Otto Kernberg. And he very astutely pointed out that having unempathic, cold, or distant parents leaves a child emotionally malnourished. Without this emotional nourishment, a child's emotional, psychological, and, and self-identity parts of themselves never quite fully develop. And instead, they focus more, the child ends up putting more focus on developing their outer world, since they're not getting any feedback that allows them to work on their inner world. Children who grow up like this may develop the kinds of superficial skill sets that will win over their unavailable parents, which may include being a pleaser, helping around the house, being physically attractive, excelling at sports, or embracing a hobby that a parent really enjoys. Like, for example, knowing a parent loves fishing or loves golfing. The child may throw themselves in wanting to fish or wanting to golf or play tennis, whatever it is the parent loves. And the child never really thinks about whether they like fishing or golfing or tennis. They just want desperately to have that parent be interested in them. You also might see a children doing things like really trying to overachieve as a student or overdeveloping some other niche skill, such as playing an instrument, dancing, winning spelling bees, uh, playing chess. So as, again, love to hear from you. Drop a comment if this rings true for you about what you know about the backstories of narcissistic people that you've encountered. Was that, was that sort of any of what they were about? Now, this dichotomy of having an underdeveloped and undernurtured inner emotional world while having an outside self that is actually seen and perhaps validated by the parents, not surprisingly, this can result in a compartmentalized little person. For children in these situations, there is little opportunity to talk about or express or even be with their feelings because those aren't seen or valued, but instead the child really just focuses on the thing that the parent loves about them. And this can be a really, really challenging issue for a child who is not able to excel in any manner that a parent values. For example, they can't learn to play baseball the way the parent wants or look the way the parent wants. That can then result in a tremendous anxiety for the child, a really sort of cracked and crumbled self-esteem, negative mood states, and lots of self-devaluation. The compartmentalized child may believe their 
talents or whatever it is that's getting the parent's attention is sort of their superpower. In some children, they may even become more grandiose about their outer worlds and their outer talents. And if they do, if that child does experience moments of vulnerability or of weakness, they will deny that vulnerability because growing up with parents who are not sort of giving them that feedback, they were taught that it's not safe to be vulnerable. This is a process that Dr. Kernberg terms splitting. It's as though that child experiences themselves in two distinct ways, and they're not able to integrate the two. That the, for the child, that strong and good version that does stuff and that the parents like the stuff they do, and then that's different than the weak and vulnerable version who actually has feelings. This actually really does line up with that dichotomy that we see in adult narcissistic people. That sort of grandiose and preening and pretentious adult who walks around extolling how great they are, but when things don't go the way they want, they are overwhelmed with shame, which often gets expressed as rage. Rage at this sort of emotional part of them, which is clouding the, grand, super, the grandiose superpower version of themselves, right? And the rage actually leaves the child feeling powerful for a minute. So that's even another superpower, right? But then they have shame at the rage because people don't like them being rageful and angry and tantrumy. So it really sucks to be that too. So the child is really struggling to get their footing. As a person comes into adulthood, compartmentalization is often why a narcissistic person can seem two-faced or over-focused on appearances or accomplishments or even to be able to do bad things and then jump right back into their usual lives. For example, a narcissistic person may able, be able to cheat on a spouse, come home from their cheating episode and still really, really convincingly be a devoted family member or You'll see a narcissistic person be incredibly, cruelly rageful at night and then wake up fine and expect things to be forgiven and return to normal in the morning and make breakfast and act like nothing happened. Or a narcissistic person can seem like a devoted and loving partner at a dinner party and as soon as you get into the car, they'll start raging at you in private. Compartmentalization can also drive something called projection. Projection is when they accuse you or accuse someone of something that isn't true of the person being accused, but is in fact true of them, but there's shame about it, right? So they just project it. It's their fractured identity, the acceptable them and the unacceptable them, them, right? And so they project the unacceptable parts of themselves onto someone else which allows then that unconscious part of them to not have to live in this tense place of, oh, not so good. So what can a parent do or anyone raising a child do to stave off the likelihood of this compartmentalization experience? First of all, all parents, this isn't just about compartmentalization, this is just basic parenting. Ask your children how they feel regularly. Don't always get focused on the what did you do today or how was the game, but how do you feel? And reinforce and explore their emotional worlds and words. Teach them it's okay to use words like sad and happy and worried and let them practice using them. You can also obviously ask them how their day was, but if they share a difficult or good experience, ask them the questions that allow them to tie that into emotion or give them the space to share their emotions. Second, you never ever want to shame a child's feelings and you definitely never want to gaslight their feelings. You don't want to say things to them like, you don't want to say to them, well, you shouldn't feel that way. Or don't ever say things like, that feeling doesn't make sense. They feel the way they feel. If their feelings are confusing to you, let them explain. Don't judge them and don't tell them you're confused by their feelings. Let them talk. So many pe parents feel that there's a right emotion. There's not. Give your child time and space to talk about theirs. Their emotion is valid because it is their emotion. And just because you're uncomfortable with their uncomfortable emotions, that's on you, not them. 
Number three, so let's build on that. Don't let your discomfort about your child's unhappiness stop you from being present with your child's feelings, especially when they are uncomfortable feelings. Parents want their children to be happy. And sometimes we even blame ourselves when our children aren't happy. We all have sad days, adults, children, everyone, and it's okay. Our discomfort can lead us to say, oh, come on now, little one, is it really that bad? Let's figure out a way to cheer you up now. Again, that invalidates their feelings. It's far better, it's difficult, but it's better to be present with their sadness, recognize and allow them, give them the space to be okay with the idea that there are sad days. And I can sit here and be with your sad emotions and it's not scary and it's all good. If we as parents are scared of their negative emotions, they will learn to be scared of them too. Rather than recognizing that expressing them is a normal part of a human being's repertoire and that feelings, they're like weather, they come, they go to give your child faith in that process. Fourth, be proud of your children, certainly, but ensure that, that it's balanced against the rest of them. If they only see you cheering at the top of your lungs at their game or their performance, but seemingly relatively sort of disinterested in the humdrum or emotional stuff in their lives, they will quickly recognize that the performing version of themselves is more desirable. Be as present with the everyday stuff and the emotional stuff and at times the difficult stuff as you are during the more performative stuff like the high stakes soccer game or the school play. They need to know you are interested in all of them, in the whole them. Fifth, don't make them deliver on your agenda for them. I can also say this as a parent, it's tempting and normal to want your child to obviously succeed, but it's also tempting to have your child do what you're interested in and so you can use your knowledge and access to open them up to it and teach them more. Certainly you can introduce them to things that you're interested in, but pay attention to whether they're actually enjoying those things themselves. And don't make it aversive. You don't need to be demanding and critical and require that they do well at, with it, but watch how they take it in. Many times children reject parental activity agendas for them because the parents become tyrants. Expose your children to a variety of activities to the degree you're able and trust your children's preferences. A child is absolutely enthralled when their parent just wants to be with them and just wants to be present with them. Your child doesn't need to be trying to win the America's Cup or the World Cup or the World Series. Sometimes they just want their parent to throw a ball, to bake a cake, to laugh with them, to color, to play cards, to play a board game. Listen, not every child is meant to be an Olympian, but every child does need a present, loving parent who is aware of them and values them, not just what they do. Number six, be careful about how you talk with them about any performance lapses they're having in places like school. I firmly believe that the way we educate children does not work for all children. And as a result, your child may be struggling in school for any number of reasons. Instead of lashing out at your child, work collaboratively with the school, work collaboratively with your child, avoid being accusatory, and figure out their gifts and their strengths. I have watched endless numbers of children be broken by the academic expectations that were heaped on them and the sense that they would, and sadly in some cases did, lose their parents' regard if they didn't do well, rather than the parents meeting the child where they are and how, how the child experiences school. Love them. Love them with all A's, love them with all C's, love them with all D's. Love them if they're told that their per performance doesn't meet expectations. Love them if they don't play in the game, love them if they do. Just love them. Give your child a strong, integrated psychological core and they will find their way. Not every kid is supposed to go to Harvard and sometimes 
performance lapses at school can be revelatory of a whole host of reasons that are getting in the way of being able to participate in school. Be patient with them, work with their teachers and others to get to the bottom of it. Let them know they're loved and valued so that school and education actually becomes a good space for them. So please drop a comment. If your child's, if your co-parent is a narcissist, what are you already doing to, I guess, decrease the likelihood that your child will compartmentalize? Or if you grew up with a narcissistic parent, what did your non-narcissistic parent do that maybe helped you to not do this? Addressing the whole child, not just what they can do, but all of them, is essential. And it's a benefit of addressing, the, and, a, and a huge benefit of addressing this whole, the whole child, is to stave off the compartmentalized psyche. That compartmentalized sort of psychological insides, that can be the prelude to a narcissistic personality in adulthood. Honestly, if every child got the things I'm talking about in this video, it would change the world forever. Children would no longer feel that to be loved, they have to be good at something or they have to be helpful only or they, they, or they have to get attention and applause. And they would stop being adults who seek out validation for what they do or they would or feel that they have to cut off from their emotions and their vulnerability and instead simply be adults who know that they're good people to learn that emotions are not shameful and that all of us are lovable, cherishable, and have our own gifts and feelings. Thanks again for tuning in. I'm Dr. Romani, and if you like this video, give us a thumbs up and please subscribe. Appreciate you tuning in and hope that not only these videos, but the shared sorts of experiences that people are putting out there in the comments becomes another place for you to recognize that none of us are alone in this.